So the, the first aspect I wanted to touch on was that the typical systematic review is designed to evaluate a, a beneficial outcome or an intended uh, outcome. And these beneficial outcomes are usually pre-specified, uh, well-defined, and there's a, a clear purpose for uh, measuring them. So beneficial outcomes are usually the main focus of the research study, and therefore they're uh, rigorously monitored, clearly defined, and in a typical uh, randomized controlled trial, there's a power calculation uh, where the sample size is uh, uh, estimated. And so the trial has a good chance of capturing me and measuring the events in sufficient numbers of participants for us to draw meaningful conclusions. And finally, uh, when there's a manuscript uh, produced, the primary outcome is usually very well reported, so we can get numerical uh, data on that. Uh, it gets more difficult when we're dealing with adverse uh, effects because the reporting is uh, much less clear and there are thousands of adverse effects uh, to deal with and which is why uh, I'm here today to uh, explain to you uh, how uh, we sort of wander into uncharted territory every so often. So one of the key aspects uh, in, in, uh, in assessing adverse effects is that adverse effects are seldom considered as the primary focus of the trial. So often they're not a primary outcome uh, or not even a secondary outcome. And this means that the adverse effects are so, uh, seldom pre-specified, they may not be well defined. So what happens is that there's inconsistent measurement, uh, they coded poorly or they might be missed altogether in the uh, uh, research study because the investigators were not uh, completely sure what they were um, measuring and they may uh, only be picked up by chance. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the studies are often not powered to detect significant differences in secondary or tertiary outcomes. So uh, given the fact that most adverse effects are less frequent than beneficial outcomes, the eventual uh, numerical data we, that we get leads us to uh, yield effect estimates that are imprecise, they're very broad confidence in tools. Uh, we're not sure um, whether there is a genuine uh, difference uh, in adverse effect uh, rates or not. And finally, because adverse events are poorly reported, uh, most authors are focused on reporting the main outcomes, then we are not very clear as to um, uh, the, the reporting of such events in the published uh, manuscript. Right, so that's already a long list of uh, problems that we face when we're trying to conduct a, a systematic uh, review of adverse effects. The other problem that reviewers constantly run into is that where do we start? And this creates major challenges because there's almost a limitless, a hugely diverse range of adverse effects. And for a single trial to capture all types, whether it's a common adverse event or a rare adverse event, or whether the adverse event occurs shortly after the intervention or in the long term, it's it's very, very difficult for any single study to, uh, to reliably capture all, uh, all these types of diverse adverse events. Now, obviously, some of these adverse events can be predicted, uh, for instance, wound infection from surgery. So as a reviewer, you would be quite confident um, if you're looking at a surgical uh, trial to say, well, I, I would like to know uh, wound infection uh, after the surgical uh, procedure. And, uh, and that's a fair enough uh, thing to, uh, to focus on. But obviously for new interventions, uh, things that have been uh, newly developed or have just entered the, uh, the healthcare arena, we don't know all the adverse effects. Some new things will happen, some unexpected things will happen, and these may not be correctly uh, diagnosed at the time. And Indeed, uh, there, there are trials where you will find there are footnotes to it uh, that, uh, that were added subsequently that say, so we, uh, we uh, did some post hoc evaluation and, uh, and uh, were shocked to find that uh, some new adverse events uh, had emerged that we, uh, we hadn't predicted before. So it's not possible to pre-specify all the adverse effects and interest. And that's a major problem for, uh, for, for reviewers. Uh, 
And as I've already mentioned, certain adverse effects are reported well, and others are selectively non-reported. So uh, given the huge diversity of adverse uh, effects that are um, uh, presented and uh, measured, uh, there's a, a high risk of false alarms arising from multiple statistical uh, testing. And that, that's an inevitable uh, problem. So um, I've uh, just got an example uh, of uh, a systematic review uh, that we did on myocardial infarction with uh, rosiglitazone. Uh, we were able to access the clinical trial report on the GSK trial register. And when we looked for myocardial infarction, this is the table that, uh, that we uh, saw in the trial report. And there were numerous uh, descriptions of myocardial infarction. Um, some very uh, important and similar cardiac events were reported in different uh, categories. And we had great difficulty with this sort of uh, example. Um, it was impossible for us to judge whether the top category of myocardial infarction is the same as the one that's like five uh, rows down that says acute myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndrome, or myocardial ischemia. So this slide just illustrates uh, the earlier point that I'm making that there's a huge diversity of uh, adverse events uh, that are poorly defined or recorded uh, differently. And it makes us impossible to judge whether the same event was coded more than once, uh, even if the number of events is uh, the number of uh, patients. So that, uh, that is the major uh, challenge for systematic reviewers in um, uh, trying to work out where, uh, which ones are the adverse events that are of interest, which ones they should data extract and report on. Um, another common problem in adverse events uh, reviews is that uh, composite measures are very commonly reported in the trial reports, and this include composite endpoints such as total number of serious adverse events in the intervention group as compared to the control group, or total withdrawals uh, due to adverse events in the, in the arms of the study. Uh, and we should approach uh, these composites with uh, uh, caution. Even though they are very, very uh, frequently reported, uh, there are a number of issues uh, that uh, we can think about. They suffer the same flaws as any other composite measure. So, and in some ways, they're even worse than other composite measures because uh, the total number of withdrawals is a huge mishmash of really diverse events. Um, and I've put at the bottom, it's like who decides what the reason was for withdrawal. Um, it's often complex, multifactorial. Perhaps the patient wasn't uh, getting much efficacy from the treatment and they had a mild adverse effect. And so they decided it wasn't worth pursuing or they're too busy to continue in the trial. So reason for withdrawal is really difficult. And the main problem with a composite measure is that the elevated risk of a rare adverse event may be obscured by common adverse events. So mortality, which occurred in 1%, could be obscured by dry mouth or nausea or vomiting that occurred in 10 or 20% of participants. So you might miss the signal for a serious adverse event uh, that uh, has a lower frequency than the um, common ones. So it's a, it's a real challenge uh, interpreting uh, composite adverse events, but it is common in adverse event uh, reviews, but they should be treated with extreme uh, caution.